Today's guest gathered a bunch of scientists and very innovative farmers and their neighbors to answer one of the big questions in regenerative agriculture that so far we only anecdotally answered. Does regenerative grazing work to restore soil, people, local communities, biodiversity, insect, birds, store a lot of carbon, reduce methane, all of those things, and create more farmers' wealth? The first data seems very positive. But very importantly, what happens if the conventionally grazing neighbors were presented with this data? And remember, they share a fence line, which means they have exactly the same climate, the same soil type. Everything is the same except the management. So what would happen? Would they change? Would they change their behavior? Would they change their management? And would they also transition? Find out today with today's guest. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in regenag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in regenag. Or find the link below. Welcome to another episode. Today with filmmaker and wrangler of scientists, Pete Bick. Welcome, Pete. Thank you. Good to be here. And I mean, we're going to touch on both of those those angles, obviously, but let's just, for people that haven't seen your work, um, let's take us under a brief tour back of what got you into uh, focusing on soil, which is not, let's say, the normal topic for, for filmmakers, at least. It, it's starting to become more, like I said, become slightly more fa- fancy, obviously, over the last years. Uh, but, mm-hmm. but when you started, I don't think it was a topic that, that was easily, let's say, captured in front of a camera. It wasn't talked about very much, and um, it was a bit lonely out there at first. My entree into documentary filmmaking about these subjects started with um, seeing an Inconvenient Truths world premiere at Sundance. And it hit me as, oh my gosh, climate change is a really big problem. What are the solutions? And so we made a film called Carbon Nation, which was all about solutions to climate change. And in the making of that film... I was taught about soils being both a huge problem and a huge potential resource for slowing down climate change, that soils in their natural state are actually inhaling carbon at a massive amount. Soils in their unhealthy state are exhaling carbon in a massive amount. And so you use that breathing uh, metaphor. Yeah, which is true. You can see the earth breathing if you look at the certain satellite images. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a, uh, a scientist named Wendy Silver who really proved, showed me that, talked me through that. She's at UC Berkeley. And so it was people that she was working with, like John Wick, who started the Marin Carbon Project, and Pete Willis down in South Africa, who taught me some more about this grazing. And then the folks at the Rodale Institute and Tim LaSalle and the folks there were teaching me about soils and compost and and the ability for soils, if they're covered, to be incredibly vibrant microbial universes. And, uh, and so with all that in my mind, as I was toured carbonation for three years, uh, at the end of that touring in 2012, I was really wanting to focus on the one thing, if I had one solution I could just focus on for s- solving climate change, helping to solve climate change, what would that be? And I was looking at the soils as the biggest scale, the biggest potential. And then within that, my research kept bringing me to grazing. And so the fellow who did the narration for Carbon Nation, a guy named Bill Curtis, had a company called Tallgrass Beef Company. And his advisor was Alan Williams. And he said, if you want to learn about any kind of regenerative grazing, you need to talk to Alan Williams. And so Alan and I spoke in 2012, and that was the beginning of my life as it is right now. 
Um, Alan introduced me to Gabe Brown, who introduced me to Neil Dennis. And those three gentlemen are the stars of the first short film I made in this world called Soil Carbon Cowboys. And we made 10 short films around the U.S. and the U.K. of farmers in very different ecosystems, severe drought-ridden New Mexico, Kansas after a massive couple of years of drought, incredibly wet Mississippi, insanely wet Cornwall and Devon, and, and everything in between. And, and the type of grazing these folks were doing, which we've come to call AMP grazing, adaptive multi-paddock grazing, um, was working in every one of those ecosystems. It was saving water in the dry places. It was getting water flushed through cleanly in the wet places. And all those short films, we made 10 short films. And um, that showed me, I, I couldn't find a place where amp grazing wasn't working, but there was no science, very little, very, very little science. And so concurrently to making all those short films, I helped organize a team of scientists thus the Wrangler part of my introduction. And we designed a project to test whether amp grazing was better for the land and whether it was better for the farmer and whether it was a greenhouse gas sink. Those, three are, those were our three main questions. And so we spent many years designing, many years fundraising. And in 2018, we hit the road to start doing research on five farm pairs in the Southeast US where it was amp grazing on one side of the fence and conventional grazing on the other side of the fence. And we spent from 2018 to 2022 gathering data. And I concurrently made a documentary about all that. And that documentary is called Roots So Deep, You Can See the Devil Down There. And I encourage everybody to see the trailer. First of all, go and see Carbon Cowboys. Definitely, I'll put, put everything yep. below. But go and see the yep. trailer. You can see the, the wrangling, uh, wrangling happening and you can see uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the journey, which is uh, a very long one, but there is uh, quite a fun one, or at least that's what the documentary tries to show. Uh, this, is, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a journey filled with, uh, with laughs as well. Yeah, and, and when people have seen the films, we, we've screened episodes one, two, and three have been done for almost a year. And episode four, we still had to wait for our greenhouse gas cycling data, the most comprehensive study of greenhouse gas cycling on grazing we've been told we have done. And it's incredibly complicated and incredibly expensive. So it was the last thing we got funded and it took longer than all the other, all the other teams. And so we just got that data in December. And really our scientist is still analyzing it but we got like the most conservative numbers from her so we could put it in the film so we just finished the film episode four last week so the four and, episodes and, are like four yeah. no they're not four different farms because you have five so walk us through the why four episodes and and yeah i'm, I'm hunch my hunch is that the data side is at the end um but yep. what, what are four why four chapters or four episodes of this story yeah so it, it the way it worked where we started in woodville mississippi that farm pair was just naturally the way to start the film. We did, it, it just worked out that way in the editing. I shoot a lot and it, it takes a lot of work for the editing to get done because there's no script, there's no structure. We just shot and shot and shot. We didn't know we were shooting a four part series. I thought I was shooting a documentary film that was gonna be 90 minutes. Um, but we just had, too many stories, too much information. When did you realize it was going to be more than that? Like you're sort of, what is it, Peter Jackson moment, like it should be three films. I mean, not that yeah, when they were yeah. shooting, that he, he, I think he managed to do that before um, convincing the, the studio. But when was the moment like, we're yeah. just never going to fit this in 90 minutes? Well, when you just said Peter Jackson, I thought you were going to be talking about uh, uh, the Hobbit, Get Back. Right. Oh, yeah. what no, no, oh. Get Back, the Let It Be documentary, because he was planning on doing a nine oh, wow. re recut of that documentary. But then COVID hit and they had all that time and he realized this would be a great, I think they've made it eight hours. Wow. Okay. I think That's they've made fans. it eight hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I'm, and I'm one of them and I loved it. Um, but for us, we went through a number of editors before we found the editor that was the right editor for the job and the bravest editor, quite frankly. And each of my first two editors who had really seen all the footage, both of them said, I think you've got a series here. And then once we really got into it with, our, with the editor that made the film, his name's Ben Daughtry, once Ben got really into the footage, he, he, basically, he said the same thing. And I didn't tell him what other people had said. 
And so it was three completely different editors who had seen all the footage to that point saying the same thing. And I was like, oh my God, we didn't raise money for this, the work it's going to take. And it, it took a lot of work. So episode one is the Woodville, Mississippi pair. Episode two is a farm pair in, in, in Piedmont, Alabama. I'm sure you've heard of Piedmont. And episode three is in Fort Payne, Alabama. Episode four is uh, in Sequatchie Cove in Jasper, Tennessee. And episode, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going wrong. I'm telling you the farm numbers, not the film, the episode numbers. Episode one is definitely Woodville, Mississippi. Episode two is definitely Piedmont, Alabama. But then episode three, we have the rest of the, of the farm pairs, Fort Payne, Alabama, Sequatchie Cove, Tennessee, and then uh, Adolphus, Kentucky. And then that was all filmed in the first two years of our research. And then we had to wait two more years for the scientists to do their analysis and get their lab work done. And then we went back out. So episode four is us giving the farmers the data. I understand. Yeah. Uh, and, and how then, difficult was it to find those pairs? Like what's the, I mean, I'm yeah. not imagine. I mean, sort of me imagining that finding the, the, the regenerative one or, or the one that is on this journey for a while is maybe not mm -hmm. the difficult one with the connections you have and, and your friends. Right. But then right. the pair, like how, how easy is it to, and, and what, what do you need from them? Like how deep are you looking into their, their kitchen, let's say, and their soils? Yeah, that's, I like that phrase, how deep are we looking into the kitchen? Because everyone's private, and, and I think farmers maybe more so. You know, they don't even want to be going into an office if they can help it. Unfortunately, a lot of farmers do have off-farm jobs because that's how they make their ends meet. Um, what we did uh, was we sent out a survey that went to thousands of farmers across the U.S., but we let them know we were focusing on the southeast U.S. first. We got about 90 surveys back that had some form of amp grazing, some form of moving their animals multiple times in a week and keeping them in one or two herds, you know, those sorts of things, those parameters that we were honing in on ourselves. And then of those 90, we found 25 that were worth scouting. And so Steve Applebaum, our lead ecologist, and Rye Thompson, who was his project manager, and I scouted those 25 ranches in the southeast this that was in 2017 and of those ranches we picked four four amp ranches uh farms um and then one of those four said you need to check out this guy in piedmont alabama john lyons and so john became our fifth and so instead of four we had five so then we had to go to their neighbor across the fence on most of them three are across the fence two are down the road and see if indeed their neighbor had the same soil type and see if the same soils were sloped the same way and, and aspect towards the sun the same way. We were really specific about trying to get it as apples and to apples as possible. And then we had to ask the farmers, can we do research on your land? And, and they all said yes. And they all, you know, some were very suspicious. Um, but we said, they hey, say listen. yes, because you came in with like their neighbor or you just knocked on her like look where we're doing because i'm imagining some of these farms are are probably known as the weirdos in their community like yep. they're definitely not the the conventional path so yep. or did you just like how do you do that like because that's always the con i mean we're getting to that but like you see over the fence line a farm probably objectively doing a lot better or feel doing better or or at least yep. more alive more more production the farmhouse might be in order. I still remember why I'm into this space because I read an article on holistic plant grazing in, in Australia and they were touring these as a consultant touring these properties. And most of them that have, apl have applied these practices were just doing a lot better and had more time on their hands. Some started a solar business next, next to it because they just had too much time. And others were yep. like, yeah, our carrying capacity is X and our costs are way lower and, and always asking the question as well. Uh, Tony Lovell and, and Bruce Wade, who are unfortunately no longer with us, like, why is your yep. neighbor not going? And 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 we're like, yeah, they look at us, and then they see the house that is not falling apart, and somehow they just convince themselves it's a different climate or a different soil. And yeah, so they knew that we, they could be confronted with that it was management, not climate. Yeah, and still they say yes. yes. They said yes. Uh, two of them said yes because it was their neighbor, right, who they trusted. One of them said yes, because it was his cousin. And two of them, we had to just start from scratch. 
we didn't know them. They didn't know us. They didn't know the neighbor that we were using. So we had sort of the spectrum yeah, yeah. Of, of, of that. Um, and we basically said, we're looking at farming. We think we found a way that can make you more money uh, with less expenses. Um, but we can't find out unless we do the science. Would you let us do the science? And we're going to be covered beautifully with insurance so that you're not going to be at risk on any front on that. And you can kick us off anytime you want. And so, uh, you know, we, we make it really easy for them to, to tell us to leave if they want to. So far we've been lucky and none of them have told us to leave. Um, we've made friends. I, 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 this project has been a life changing project for me and my family. And, um, and now there's 10 farms in this country that I can go visit in any time I want. And, uh, there's more farms cause we've been meeting farmers for a long time now, but it's just been great. And, and the one thing I wanted to tell you about episode four was the beginning is when we give them the data, right? And so we're bringing them together. We're bringing the neighbors together on a porch and telling them what each side is like, but then we wait another year or a big chunk of time to see if it has any effect. Because the be big my other question, question is, yeah, yes. it, does it lead showing the data? Like we keep saying, oh, we need more data, data, data. Does it lead to yeah. the shift we would like to see? Yeah, well, um, that's episode four. So folks will have to watch episode four. But um, all I can say is I'm in a good mood. And if we can help farmers make more money and, and treat their land and even better, every farmer cares about their land. There's no question about that. But if they can learn ways to make their land more more pleasant for birds to come migrate to them, which is what we're seeing, um, I think I think every farmer would be open to it. It's just how it's presented to them, and then what's the next step, right? And so as we make this project and we we we've done all this work and all this research and all this science and all this filming, now the question is, can we get other farmers to change? you know, where it doesn't take a 10 year project or a four year visit to their farm or a four hour documentary, can we get them to change from watching the four hour documentary, you know? And then if they want to change, then we just introduce them to Alan Williams and Gabe Brown and then walk on to the next farmers, really. That's the goal. And was there a reason besides I'm imagining funding to, because Carbon Cowboys was more global to keep it in um, that part of the U.S. to to I mean, luckily, probably with with Corona, you, maybe you filmed most of it before. But anyway, that didn't happen. But um, was there a reason to keep it in the pairs? Let's say there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when our team got together in 2014, we had two big meetings, the science team, and we put we we decided that there were nine regions in North America that we wanted to study, and really in the U.S. eight in continental US and, and Hawaii, because why not? Um, but the fundraising was so uh, difficult and hard. And in 2014, there weren't a lot of people that wanted to study this type of grazing at all. And the fact that we got big companies to see a reason to study this type of grazing shows that we were making a good case and that they were seeing, you know, what we were talking about. And so we, we, um, we had to pick one region. We thought we were going to raise money for two regions and we had to just pick one. Now we are doing the science in that second region. Now we raised the money for that. So that's the Northern great plains. Now why the U S is because we're all based here and just, you have to go to those sites a lot while you're working. Um, but we, we have colleagues in England, Australia, New Zealand, and France who are getting some amp grazing research going now. Um, and we need more. We need more. Um, I'd love to do some in the Netherlands. I'd love to do some in Germany. Um, you know, I don't know a lot about what just happened in the Netherlands with this new political party because the farmers were being told that they were going to get their cows taken away because they were methane emitters. Um, but that was a real interesting, you know, just from the, I'm watching that from afar. Um, I can tell you from our research our greenhouse gas cycling research is incredibly rigorous with many different methods of gathering the data, both old and new. And amp grazing in the Southeast US is a greenhouse gas sink at, at a large amount. And, and like so carbon, like CO2 equivalent, because it's always that little word that we see yeah. underneath. Like it's, CO2, yep. 
where we see this and it's, it's beautiful tricky. but very annoying infographic that is n based on all the life cycle assessments, etc. But like the the beef yeah. versus etc. Which, yeah, let's, I always get annoyed when I see it on LinkedIn because it's not true. But the the underlying we need to we need that data and we need that science underlying because otherwise these infographics just keep making the tour and the rounds and it's just not um, not leading anywhere. So it's an emission sink across the board. That's what you're saying. Yeah. So when you gather the CO2, the methane, and the nitrous oxide, and you you account for that properly, which is which ones are the long term, the nitrous oxide and the CO2, which one's short term, methane, and very conservatively accounting for it, the numbers from our film, um, it's twelve point two tons of CO2e. Uh, per hectare per year is coming down on the amp side and three tons of CO2e is coming down on the conventional side. So we were surprised the conventional was actually also a sink, um, but amp is a much stronger sink. Now, this doesn't account for what happens after they leave the farm. Our research is on the farm. So if you're going to send the animals, if you're going to send the animals um, to uh, to a feedlot where they're getting corn and how's that corn raised and grown and how's the feed grown, then you're going to be getting a huge carbon footprint, a massive carbon footprint. But if you're going to be finishing these animals on grass and, and selling it that way, it's, it's a sink. It's a sink. Now, obviously the biggest part of grazing in, in North America does go to feedlot. Um, and if we change the way all the animals are grazed while they're being grazed that first year for, for you know, calves and things like that and all the mama cows for their lives, we can still have a big impact, a big impact. It's a stepping stone in the right direction. Um, it, it, it's, it's fascinating. It's massive. And I mean, first, let's, let's, uh, why, what is the difference between amp grazing and let's say holistic managed and, and rotational and, and the different terms we, we hear people use around? I think most people are more familiar yeah. with the holistic one simply because mm -hmm. of, of the Savory Institute. How do you describe mm -hmm. the difference between, let's say, those two? I'm not sure there's a big difference. Um, so why do you use the word amp? <laughs> we use the word amp because we felt like like holistic management to my understanding talks about a lot more than just the grazing mm -hmm. it's the whole econ economics of the farm and the community it goes well beyond the farm um we were finding as we were fundraising that we weren't getting traction um with holistic management mm -hmm. as the phrase and that when we did the research with the farmers from all my short films we we as a team were asking what's the best way to describe this? What's a way that describes it in a way that's quick and that's specific? So adaptive, got it. Multi paddock, got it. Grazing, got it. So amp grazing came about as a as a way to help us get the project going, and then we've tested it with ranchers all over the world, farmers, cattle farmers, and all of them like it all of them, uh, except for one. Neil Dennis wished I called it mob grazing, which is, you know, you can call term, anything yeah. you want, okay, you know, yeah. call it anything you want. Um, but that's, that's the history of why we went down the road towards amp grazing. And it probably also gets you out of a bit of the focus of, of the George Monbiots and others, I think, on holistic grazing, and specifically Ellen Savory, which they continue to pick fights, I think, on Twitter uh, all the time. Yeah. And, and mainly on that point, not mainly on that point, mainly like it, he keeps, George keeps saying, there's no data, there's no science, there's, uh, yeah. it doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. And then of course the other side starts screaming, yeah, there is data, there's science. And uh, look mm -hmm. at my pictures of the fence line, it does work. And I don't feel like we're getting anywhere. Um, but I think this, mm -hmm. um, this study could at least in those regions, let's, let's call it, be conservative, um, really answer that question. Like show me, show me the, the rigorous data. And this sounds like very yeah. rigorous data. Do you think it's going to help in that conversation on the, it's the, the, it's the, it's the yes. how, not the cow? What is the, the, the sentence there? Yeah, it's, it's not the cow, it's the yeah, how. Sorry. That, that's Russ Conser, yeah. who you've interviewed. Um, for me, with someone 
like George Monbiot, um, I would like to present him the data. How he accepts or doesn't accept the data is up, up to him, right? That's his choice. Um, but there is data. And I, you know, you talk to the most conservative scientists on our team and they'll say, yes, we've just shown it's working in the Southeast U.S., right? But we randomly picked the Southeast U.S. We randomly picked the farms we used. We very randomly found the neighbors to compare. And quite frankly, we got really, really talented conventional farmers. The grazers on our study, the conventional grazers are really good. And, and we have the data to show that. So it wasn't like we cherry picked the worst on one side and the best on the other. We got good on both sides. Um, you just, you just go to these farms anywhere. I've everywhere I've been on the planet. I go to these farms and it's so significantly different. Um, the smell, the squishiness of the soil, the sound, the life. Um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, for folks who, who dismiss, the fact that regenerative grazing is successful and a positive. I'm just wondering if they've been visiting these farms because it's such a powerful, that's what got me, right? I mean, I changed. I mean, when we made Carbon Nation, I thought meat was bad. We made a movie, we made a short cartoon about how, you know, eating meat was going to kill all the rainforests. We were in that position. We say in the thing at the end of the film, what you can do, meatless Mondays, just, you know, that's where we were coming from when, when I learned all what I learned when I made Carbon Nation. But then I met these farmers, I visited these farms, and then I really got into the filmmaking, and then I really got into the science, and I've changed. I've changed. So if I've changed, maybe other people can change. It's, it's good news. That's the thing. This is actually good news. There is a scalable, massively affordable, profitable way to help slow down climate change, to help mitigate climate change, all the while you're creating, you're rewilding farms. That's what's happening. That's what these farmers are doing. Wildlife is coming to their farm and not across the fence. That's what our data is showing. Have you looked at the quality piece as well? Like in, in the science, maybe you, this wasn't the thing when you were fundraising, but the whole nutrient density piece, like comparing the, mm -hmm. the two pairs as they're so similar, soil, slopes, the whole thing you just described. Did you yep. have a bit of budget left to look at the, what's in the end product or have you, have you for sure you tasted it, but is there anything you can say about that? Yeah, that piece was not in our scope you have to stop someplace. Of course. Um, yeah. But there's a great scientist, Stefan van Fleet, Which we have, um, yeah. who's, who's studied with Fred Provenza, who's a great scientist. They've been looking at that for a long time. So that's going to be in their world. Um, we met Stefan a little late in the game or we would have tried to do that work. Um, it, it, it's tricky because tracing animals, once they get into the feedlot system, is very different, difficult. Um, but we've talked to Stefan about our work in the Northern Great Plains. If there's a way to, in the field, take a, a, a biopsy, like a really a flash biopsy from the animals in the fields and see if we can do that. So we're talking to him about that. Um, obviously, that's, that's a very important piece to the, to the puzzle. Yeah, and I was just wondering, because you have these quote-unquote perfect pairs. Of course, now it changed because you've presented results to them. And so... Yep probably management potentially you're optimistic you said so i'm imagining and my hunch is something has changed at the neighbors but um we we need those pairs not i mean there will be many of those because everyday farmers get on the transition and we can compare to their neighbors uh, but it's an interesting yep. it's a very interesting angle we're running a, a full nutrient density series on that with stefan fred etc um, but i was just wondering of course you have to stop somewhere you cannot just uh, especially from the fundraising, because also this kind of research isn't cheap and you need the right kind of labs and, and all of that. And and then yep. what was the most surprising feature or what not feature, what was the most surprising finding out of the research piece? You said you really, we really went deep on, on every possible angle you can imagine. Soil, I'm yeah. imagining insects, everything we can see and cannot see. What has been your biggest mm -hmm. surprise? My biggest surprise was something you alluded to earlier when we were told that 
all the conventional neighbors thought the amp farmers were crazy or goofy or different or weird and all those sorts of things, right? And they judged them and they didn't want to talk about anything. You know, that's what we were told. But what we discovered, you know, science, science is always, you think about data, you think about soil samples and greenhouse gas measurement, but you, you know, these are all about people. This whole thing is about people. The scientists are people, the farmers are people, the filmmakers are people, the editors are people. And what I was blown away by very early in the filming was that the conventional farmers didn't judge their neighbors. They were really curious. So they were looking over the fence line. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they are absolutely looking over the fence line and they saw more grass and they saw healthy animals, but they were too polite to ask. So you're saying the regenerative revolution has been not unfolding because we were too polite to ask. And the ant farmer was too polite to toot their own horn. Which I can, I mean, that part I can get like, okay, I'm not going to tell them what to do because who am this I? This is the biggest, yeah. Wow. So the fact that you the got them on the finding. same porch, even without data, you probably would have the fact, okay, you had the excuse of the data to get them on the porch and, and have tea or coffee or whatever we were drinking. And, and but just to compare or just to have that conversation, which they normally never have yeah. because both sides were too polite to ask. Like, can yeah. I ask you what you're that's doing? Exactly, yeah. That's exactly it. And so that, that scene that's in episode one, you know, I, I was hearing this curiosity from the conventional farmer. Um, because there's a scene in the teaser I, in the trailer that says, do you think they will change? I, I don't remember the exact, but, and they were like, yeah, yeah I don't know. And of course, t talking to the regenerative focus one. Yeah, I don't know, maybe yes, maybe not. And it, it follows that, of course, edited into a trailer. And and yeah, there was, of course, a bit of suspense. Like, is that going to happen or not? Do you think, or is it too late yeah. or too old or too conventional or too, 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 too? So there's the, sorry, yeah. there's the scene in episode one where you've felt and heard that, that politeness. Yeah, well, it was, I, I heard the conventional farmer was curious. I knew that the amp farmer had answers for him and would love to talk to him, but just, didn't want to. They were did friends, you, but did they you just, did you make that match happen, or did you also think that's yeah. going to jeopardize my my scientific journey at the moment? No, no, no. I guess it was a gamble by making that match happen, but um, but again, these are people, and 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 people. I care about people, and so I I ask them, hey, when we come back in July, this was the first summer of filming. We were there all May and a bunch of June. I'm like, hey, we're going to come back in July would you two like to sit on the porch and just ask each other questions and just talk about this? And they both said yes. And it's, I mean, at some point I would like to just put the three hour conversation up online because it's, it's fascinating. And, you know, obviously we have good editors and we cut it down to fit. No, but the, still the that, that image film. that, that would be very, very powerful because that's transition yeah. happening in front of your camera, basically. And that's and from good and, farmers, like you were saying before, it's not that the conventional yeah, were talented, like badly, like the soil was run down and, and not looking after anything. Like these were basically yeah. top of their game, conventional farmers, top, top of their game, conventional, been doing it for generations. And, you know, now we're getting data showing that the difference between their farm and their neighbor's farming, what are they going to do about it? Are they going to do anything about it? That's the through line for our series. What's going to happen? And that, for me, that's the through line for the next chunk of at years of my life because I know that this is a solution, not the, but a, and I now need to make sure every farmer that wants to hear this, hears this because then they have a choice they can make and it will be beneficial to society. It'll be beneficial for their neighbors and their their watersheds. I love the idea of getting enough farmers within a watershed to to focus on nature first, and and then that water coming off the watershed is cleaner. And the cities downstream spend less money cleaning the water. The cities downstream have less flood mitigation problems because Could more be of that water is soaking in. For the transition. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's. There's so much money that can be made. It's just there's so the markets don't exist. How do you how do you market, how do you build an instrument of a city saving money from 
from cleaning their water less. Like, where does that exist yet? And I think, so and, I know you. I think New York yeah. has something on the. I, I don't remember when, but in the Upper Hudson Valley. Yes. They were supposed it's to a put great a, story. They were supposed to put like another filter insulation, which cost I'm just random number two billion something. And they figured out it yep. was cheaper to work with farmers to lose less chemicals. Yeah, that was that was. Um, um, so what uh, seems possible? When, because it's sort yeah, of downstream. Was, it's very easy. Like it drops something here, and it's going to end up in your water there. Like there's no question. Yeah. And and somehow we haven't seen many of these outcome based schemes yet. I think, but it yeah. seems the time seems well, right. You know, the whole phrase ecosystem services. You know, many smart people have been working on this for a long time. You know, how do you how do you how do you monetize the water piece? And that's being monetized. That's happening. Is it's just it needs to happen more. Um, what I wish, I wish the United States lines were all like all of our state borders were watershed lines. And that's straight. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that each state's water, they really saw what they couldn't send it downstream. Right. Like in Kentucky, where I'm from, there's Lake Cumberland. And there was a company that was wanting to stay on Lake Cumberland and keep polluting. But everyone was really upset because Lake Cumberland's also a great tourism spot. And so the company was at the time, the biggest employer in the state of Kentucky they left. They went to Arkansas. But it wasn't just Lake Cumberland they were putting effluent into. It was the river. The Cumberland River goes down into Nashville, right? Another state, another government, another whole thing. And so if the Cumberland state existed, yeah. you know, it would have been their own backyard. There would have been their own front yard that they would have been polluting. It would have been different. It would have been different. And so... On the ecosystem services side, how important or not at all do you think the carbon side is going to be? Like the carbon credits, the soil credits, there's a lot of hype. Feels very hypey yeah. to me, but um, there's there's yeah. there's real money being paid to some ranchers here and there. Um, so mm -hmm. what what is your take of having spent a lot of time with farmers at the front end of this uh, um, of this battle, journey, transition, etc.? They must be approached. They must be having thoughts about it. What, what do you think? Oh, I think the farmers are getting approached all the time and they don't know who to trust. Um, I, I'm, I'm still learning about the market piece, but the idea of carbon being a, a financial driver for change has been on our minds since the beginning of this team that started with Alan Williams and Russ Concer and me getting together in 2012, 2013, and then building, you know, bringing in the rest of the team. We thought about carbon markets from the beginning. We did our science with the idea of a carbon market. We did the measurement with verified, you know, uh, a Vera VCS. It was VCS at the time, uh, protocol number 21, right? I mean, we, that one of our, that Steve Applebaum, our ecologist and his team developed and paid for um, so we've been thinking about this. We went to Shell. I went to Shell Oil specifically because they've got such a carbon problem, such a carbon legacy, and they're spending billions of dollars on carbon capture and storage, which is, you know, incredibly expensive. Why not spend that same money getting farmers to change and, uh, and, and, and be a, a, a climate beneficial company now? And that's how Russ and I met. He was at Shell. And so I've, I've thought about these markets. We've all thought about these markets since the very beginning. Um, and we did the science because you got to start being able to measure and verify these claims that carbon is being brought down into the system. And is it going to be permanent? There's nothing in nature that's permanent, but is it going to last decades or centuries? Yeah, you can measure decadal or century long carbon storage by where it is in the, in the soil and how it's how it's in, in uh, what structure is it in the soil? What fraction is it in the soil? So all that's doable. It's just expensive, right? So the measurement and verification somewhere along the way that got abbreviated to MRV. I don't know why the R is there. It should just be MV, but measurement and verification um, is expensive right now. And we're pushing as a team to make it cheaper and cheaper through, through the folks on our teams that are working on flux tower data ways to, measure greenhouse gas cycling, get it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And that's a good, strong piece to that. And so there's a lot of people that just want to use models for their carbon market data right now. And there's no model out there that, that, 
that models amp grazing. I'll give you, I guarantee you that. Um, and there's the models, there's probably good bits and bobs of all the models out there or some of the models out there. It just, it just doesn't exist yet to really be robust. And so that's one of the things that we are working on. We know other people are working on. That's what needs to happen. So the folks who want to make it cheap and just use models to do the carbon without measurement, without, without verifying it, without getting the soil samples. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't trust that as much as, as just doing good old fashioned soil sampling, but then you can, you can create a model with AI, satellite data, soil sampling, flux data, and then, then we'll get going. We'll really make this thing a robust thing. I think we're just a little bit ahead of the game right now to really make it accurate. And so the concern on our team is that so many people are going to be making deals right now, so many farmers, and it, it, when the stuff's just not that accurate yet, and then people get burned and it, it, it leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. So that's, that's our concern as a team, that this, the technology is there. We can measure it. It's just it's not cheap yet. And so what would be your main message to of course, without giving investment advice, but to to impact investors, let's say we're doing this uh, at, at an audience. So we have a screening of, of the four parts. Mm -hmm. We're really committed, or we do two evenings. And so mm -hmm. after that, people are, of course, super excited and, and interested and yep. say, okay, how can I leave this theater and, and get to work? What would be your main message if I'm interviewing you on stage after that to them, people wearing their financial hats, either investing their own money, invest their other people's money? What what would be places for them to to go to dig deeper to learn to smell to taste etc where would you send them off to to get to work okay so i am not a financial um financially knowledgeable person very much i can take you a raise, film budget you raise money and and made a film so yeah. i mean more I, than I, most people I, yeah okay so yeah this project is a 10 million dollar project and i was the lead fundraiser for that um which was brutal i can't yeah. imagine yeah it, it's it's a lot of work uh, and it's very fulfilling to ask someone to help you save the planet. So it's an easy ask, right? And and then I became an advocate for farmers, right? As I was worrying about the climate, then I meet these farmers. So now I'm out there trying to help farmers, which feels very good as well. Um, the places where I've thought of that were financially interesting are the flux towers, um, the companies that are that are inventing and, and getting those going. The team that we have came out of Exeter and, um, and their company is called Quantera. That to me is a really necessary piece of this puzzle to get that carbon and methane measurement. They're working on the carbon right now, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And basically so, a flux tower, I mean, we discussed it with Ross as well, but it's a tower. Mm -hmm. uh, red, it's a piece of high, aluminum. But, but it basically sniffs the the gases that pass uh, that it, it can yeah. literally feel or make the breathing of the the, the plants and soil and life beneath it visible because it keeps yeah. going up and down everything that passes it's being measured it measures what's going down into the soil system and what's coming up and and the reason that our greenhouse gas data took so long to get was we had to make sure that the methane we were measuring was it the cows or not so we had cameras 360 and then a, a still shot every 30 seconds for two years. And those had to be analyzed to make sure that the methane we were counting, was it cows or was it natural? And that's why it took so long. So that's data. Not the same thing. So that's technology. I mean, yeah, that, that's an interesting distinguish. Like it was cow or natural meaning coming out of the soil or, Correct. yeah, yeah or, manure or, or whatever wildlife yeah. happened to uh, burp Walk underneath through, that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So you got to. That's a lot so of images. That's, yeah. that's how rigorous we're working to make sure our, our, our data is accurate. And, um, and so financially, the. So really on the me, sensor side, that's what you're saying. Like the. Yeah. Unlocking the technology data, making within it the sensing. dramatically cheaper to, to measure. Yeah. Uh, the opportunity of developing this model to me is, is a, is an ideal place to be. Um, working with all the different pieces of the puzzle. That's a place um, that I, if I had a ton of money, would focus. And I'm looking to raise money to focus on that. I've been in a philanthropic world 
and I'm seeing the potential for business. And so it's, it's an interesting place right now for me to be watching where I'm watching from. Um, the other thing that I think is a really important piece to this is the loans to farmers to change, financial loans. Um, the data I've seen and the conversations I've had, farmers who focus on nature are paying their loans back quicker and more, more fully. And not defaulting. And is it something? So I, there, I, I, maybe I missed it in when you said we captured everything on these pair farms. Did you look at the financial side as well, or was that too private did. in the kitchen? Well, that that that's what I liked about your your how how close are you looking in the kitchen? I love that. That must be a Dutch phrase that you're translating. I have no idea. That's a good one. <laughs> it's it's good. Whatever wherever it came from, if it came from you, Kun, it's good. Um. So. What I what I want to because uh, you make that statement like they questions. are better yeah. like nature focused farmers nature first farmers we, seem to be we asked a lot of questions, um, but farmers are very reticent to give you all their financial data, and and so what you do is you you use proxy data, how much are they spending on feed, how much are they spending on medicine, how much are they selling their animals for right those that. Those are the data that we could get, self-reported data. And um, the AMP side was, uh, let's see, it was $100 cheaper per animal to feed them and $400 more per animal to sell them. Which is and a if massive. If I'm remembering my data yeah. right. But right, it's a massive gap, animal. like whatever the, 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 the exact, yeah. that's a massive but, gap. So then why do you need transition finance? But, but check this out, check this out. And I'll answer your question about transition finance. Over and over again, when Alan Williams is out uh, doing his work, he's seeing that when people transition to AMP from CG on grazing, that they're raising their... Sorry, op, AMP, they're raising I understand. Their, what was the second thing you said? Continuous grazing. I'm sorry, CG, continu, uh, conventional grazing, continuous grazing, yeah. Um, that's just our, our abbreviation. Internally. I want to keep sorry it accessible, that. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, I try not to do that, actually. Um, so when the farmers trans... Uh, when they um, transition, they raise their carrying capacity, the amount of animals they can raise, double and triple. Which is such an overlooked thing. And this particular piece of data might be the biggest carbon data that a scientist who we were giving her this data, who is, I would call her a very conservative and very skeptical scientist when it comes to looking at grazing as a solution. Where she's been, who she studied with, and when I told her that in our Piedmont pair, the farmer that we didn't even know about, but one of the farmers said, you should go there. He's got three and a half times more animals on the same acreage as his neighbor. And that's the same rainfall. I mean, they, have a, they share a fence. And, and so that's a significant difference. So when we think about feeding the neighborhoods, world. feeding communities, feeding communities. states, feeding countries. We're scratching all the, the surface of what is possible. Scratching the surface. And there's so little data on stacking of enterprises, right? So little data. Like you go down to Will Harris's farm, White Oak Pasture. He's got 10 different types of animals grazing on his land. We have a short film called 100,000 Beating Hearts. And his dad had 2,000 beating hearts on the same acreage. He has 100,000 beating hearts, same rainfall, no irrigation. He is importing feed for, for the poultry, so that has to be factored in. Um, you know, so that, that, that heavily increased productivity to me is really important. And so there's a debate even amongst, you know, you get two scientists in a room, you're going to get an argument, right? So we have 10 or 20 scientists on our team. So there's all kinds of debates within our team. And a big debate we have is, does amp grazing take less land, more land? And if we, even if we go down the road of it takes more land than conventional, we have so much degraded land, so much degraded land across the planet, that if we have a way of regenerating the land and more acres of regeneration, that's actually a positive. That's actually a positive. So even if you look at that as a negative, it's not, it's a positive. And so coming back to the question, why does a farmer then need to transition finance? If it's such an obvious for, for like a spreadsheet farmer to see like, okay, three and a half times, I pay less for feed, 
I might have more fence costs, but maybe I'm going to virtual fencing or th that I can factor in mm -hmm. and I get more for my animals. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully, if you're connected to the right slaughterhouses, the right infrastructure locally, which is an issue in many, many places. I'm not, absolutely issue. not saying that's easy at all, but let's say you do, then, then what are the loans for you were mentioning before? Yeah. Um, so let's say that you're growing row crops, arable land, and you want to start grazing. You need a perimeter fence. That's not cheap. And a lot of the farms that we've been on, the ones that run water throughout their land, the piping, that that's a really good way to do it. It's an initial cost, but it pays itself back quickly. And And so those are the two costs. And then if you're going to be doing a different type of grazing, do you need a different type of animal? Which takes and time so you and need does cost. Yeah. And so if you need to, like the South Pole is a breed of animal that Teddy Gentry, who's in our Fort Payne study, um, he helped bring about over the last 40 years this breed. He put different animals together and it's, it's this beautiful uh, red coated um animal that works great when it's hot and humid right so you'll see all the black cows you know they're they're black they're angus cows they're all standing in ponds in the summer when you go throughout the south and rightfully so and, because they get incredibly hot i mean we and the red nobody cows would aren't. think to get a black car and that like, it doesn't make any yeah. sense yeah exactly and the red cows aren't they're and they're just built better for this type of grazing so that's a cost um And then some people say that in a transition, you'll have a year or two possibly of a productivity dip. Especially like if you've been using a lot of fertilizer, yeah, of right? And all of a sudden you stop the fertilizer, that you'll have this dip. I've been told by some that they don't see the dip. I've been told by others they do. So I, it, it seems That's to be farm by farm. Yeah. But that dip then becomes a factor as well. So, And then the idea of risk, right? Risk management, risk in the mind. Um, and so those are all the reasons that I think loans would be a really good idea. And, and, you know, I think a really smart bank would make huge amounts of money from that instrument. So that's another place where I think, um, money can be made and it would be, and I actually look at it, like I say, I, I think of this philanthropically. I look at this as sort of a collaboration between a bank and a, a philanthropic organization who is very interested in impact investing, right? So we talk about, you know, regenerating soils, but the money could be constantly reused. So if you loan money to a farmer, he pays it back quickly. You then take that same money and loan it to the next farmer. You could use the same dollar many, many, many times to make the change happen. And why do you think that hasn't happened yet at scale? Because I remember stumbling upon holistic grazing 14 years ago and already there there were stories in australia and for sure in the us and for sure in mexico and many other places of, of farmers just doing a lot better than their neighbors you would imagine that some smart finance people would have figured something out by now and somehow maybe email me if you have and you want to be interviewed but somehow it doesn't seem to like were we waiting for the data were we i think what what is i think the fact that it there? took us I think the fact that it took us, a filmmaker and a bunch of renegade scientists to do this research, why wasn't this research done before? For why example, wasn't this research done in the 70s and 80s and 90s? And so the people who were out there well ahead of us, did they try and they just didn't get it funded? Um, or we haven't heard too, busy, too many like, stories. Like the Gabe Browns and others as well, like the, the pioneers in the space. I'm completely understand that you didn't measure everything in your transition because you were no. in a transition and you were the only one by i don't know how many miles so i had, i get that but at some point a researcher should wake up and say okay yeah. it's actually like we know we have had jonathan lundgren and, and others on the show and like we see some of it and the lca of will harris is very interesting we did a deep dive on that with with mariko torbecker which i will mm -hmm. link below as well but it seems very few and then even when it shows profitability being fundamentally mm -hmm. different I would yeah. imagine people that have to put money to work, either their own or others, that would be interested at least, or jumping on it. The sec like, wh why haven't we seen that? Well, it comes back to this people question, right? It comes back to the people question. And how are people being told about this? You know, I, I just think that there was a need for more research. And, 
you just mentioned John Lundgren. You just mentioned Will Harris's study that that uh, that Jason Roundtree and and his team did. You know, these are these are our teammates, right? It, it took this team of scientists to come together to do this work. Um, I was a bit of a pit bull on making sure that we got the funding. So it's a team, right? Everyone yeah, has their spot. And you were not spot. a scientist nor a farmer, which means no. you wanted to make this movie or these four parts. You didn't know that at the time, but which no, probably gave you a different role. To, I didn't do this to make a movie. I did but this you to knew find it was going to be an interesting movie. Yeah, you knew I didn't. No, you thought, I didn't. You thought it was... No, I did not. When did no, you decide did to pick not. up the camera then in this one? No, I, I mean, when we were when we were building and spending so much time fundraising and designing this project, I had stopped filming for a long time. And then I realized, Oh, I got to get back out there. So that's when I went back out. So the short films sort of were a roller coaster of busy and not busy during that five year period from 2013 to 2018. Um, when this was a science project, cause I wanted to know if amp grazing was a climate change solution. That's why I did this. Um, it made sense to film it, so we put it in the budget, and we raised enough money to start the filming. I thought I was going to be making a film about the soil, short films. I thought I was making – when I wrote the proposal, I thought I was going to make more short films. The soil team, the bug team, the microbe team, the grazing team, the animal well-being team. I didn't know I was even making a feature. I just – prepared myself to just go film whatever was happening. You do not know if your film's going to be any good. You don't know if you're going to get any good footage when you film this way. We just went out. So I was managing the scientist and directing a feature film. So I had no clue. I, I prepared myself for the, for the, for the luck of something good happening. Right. Like the three hour hired, conversation. On the I porch. hired my, yeah. I hired a former student who, came out and shot with me. We had two cameras and um, we shot a lot of footage. We shot everything. And almost immediately, that's when I was like, okay, this is going to be interesting. But each step of the way, I had to put the science project first in the film back here. So there's many times where I would have done something as a filmmaker, but I couldn't because I couldn't do anything to jeopardize the fact that we needed to be on these farmers land for two years. Right. So it was always, the film was always secondary, always. And, and so, no, we, we did not know. We, were, we just kept filming. And then during that first year of filming, it's like, oh, that's a cool scene. That's a cool scene. But we had no clue of arc because we had no arc. So it took years to even find the arc. So it was very, very uncomfortable for a decade. I mean, you're seeing me right now. We just finished the film last week. The science is now coming out. There's eight papers published. Another 10 are going to come out. This is a different place than when I was a month ago, two months ago. Time, timing is everything. Uh, we got yeah. connected through Russ Conser, I think two weeks ago or a week ago even. Yep. And uh, yep. Um, so shout out to, to him who hopefully will be listening. Absolutely. And I want to be conscious of your time as well, which I always say and then end up asking way too many questions. So um, let's, let's try to start wrapping this up. But... I'd love to ask a question on if you could change one thing overnight, I ask as a magic wand. So you have the power uh, to, to mm -hmm. change one thing, but one thing only. Um, mm -hmm. What would that be? Every government policy around agriculture, the North Star would have to be soil health, soil regeneration. Every decision has to go through that metric. Is what you're doing and what you're subsidizing making the soil healthier or not? That would be the thing that I would one wand waved. And another one I like to ask, which is inspired by John Kemp, uh, he asks it slightly differently, but where are you, let's say among the amp grazer grazing peers um, in, in your little bubble, which is in within the little bu the bubble of, of regeneration and regen egg, where are you contrarian? Where do you think differently? Where, what do you believe to be true that others uh, in, in your little bubble don't believe to be true? I don't know if I'm contrarian. I just, uh, I've mentioned Steve Alfabaum a couple of times. He's our lead ecologist and good friend and um, on this project and in life. He is seeing that the amp grazers aren't using native species as much as they could on their, on their fields. 
And he's seeing the native species growing in the ditch by the highway right at the fence line outside the farm. So we have a sort of a wonder. It's not contrarian. It's a wonder. Have we just scratched the surface with amp grazing? And could it be much, much better if we had more of these native species whose roots go even deeper? And then that, you, you know, really see the deep devil. roots. Yeah. And then you can really see the devil down there. Would that mean like introducing um, them or sort of facilitating or creating the circumstances that they move from the highway onto the fence? Because yeah. of course they don't, they don't care about the fence line. It would be a seeding thing. It would be um, a planning thing. Um, you know, Some the farmers, of these seeds are dormant for years and they just haven't found the circumstances to... Well, we've seen that, the na you know, that latent seed bank. Folks have seen that a lot. Like if you look at our short film, A Fence and an Owner, um, that was done in the, in the high desert in New Mexico. And they had a serious drought and they changed from conventional grazing to amp grazing. And this big drought happened and they saw plants come up that they hadn't seen in that part of the world for 50, 100 years. And those plants saved their herd. So, you know. Yeah, but what's your hunch in like the, with these five or like why or you and Stephen? I why think hasn't a lot happened? of the South, a lot of the South and Southeast was so destroyed by cotton. The cotton monster destroyed so much soil. I'm not sure what's left in the in the in the soil. A lot of the soils that we were studying were like were mapped in the 30s. And I think a lot of those maps were inaccurate because those soils are gone. You know, that top layer was just about gone. Um, so that's that's my thinking there. But you know, you'd have to ask much smarter people than me on on that to get a, a better answer, a more accurate answer. But but I'm not really contrarian with folks. Um, you know, what's interesting, the contrarian would be stuff outside of the soil health. Like, I don't vote the same way a lot of the farmers that I'm friends with do, right? So we would be contrarian if we spent all day talking about what's on TV. Yeah, uh, But we don't spend all day talking about what's on TV. And that's what's really pleasant for both of us. Is probably, that yes. we're <laughs> we're having a great time talking about something we do agree on and we know how powerful that is that it lessens all the other stuff it really does um, because a lot of that's theater and this is real i think it's a perfect moment to end this conversation the the tv side could be a whole different podcast which we're we're not here for and uh, we like to like to keep it real no that's a bad sentence anyway we like to focus on the real <laughs> stuff the, the the soil and everything that it can do so i want to thank you so much for the time um thank you Kun. happy to to catch you at the the end of a cycle here and the beginning of a Big new time. one with with yep. features theaters tour shows and and all of that and i'm looking yep. forward to see the, the four-part movie yeah the tour is going to be in theaters and barns so it'll be Perfect. That's, yeah, that's and we'll, we'll send everybody to carboncowboys.org. You can follow, you can request a screening, get involved, host this if you can, take your responsibility sure. of your space and, and um, um, basically resources to do that and make sure um, this message gets out. And I'm looking forward there to you. Go. I mean, it won't be only at the US. I think there's a lot of grazing enthusiasts around the world that oh, yeah. they're looking forward to this. Um, and we're yeah. just going to step over the question. Of, of course, you picked one region and it's going to be slightly different if you go to very wet Cornwall or if you go to other regions, but it, it just um, opens hopefully the discussion of other people doing the same, like go and do that research yeah. elsewhere as well. The methods are the same. It's called adaptive multipatic grazing, right? Adaptive is the key word. You adapt to your circumstances. You adapt to the weather this week. You adapt to the weather this morning, right? And so the, but the universal methods I've seen work in, Every region I've been to, every ecosystem I've been to, that's what's, that's what's so amazing about it. <laughs> suspicious or, yeah, amazing. or it's a yeah. good idea. I mean, I've, I'm all for suspicious and skeptical and things like that. I've been on hundreds of farms over a decade and a half, and it's so consistent. So that's, that's all. It's, it's just observation. That's all it is. Perfect. Thank you so much, Pete. And uh, good luck with the next, uh, the next phase. Thank you. Thank you 
you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.